Good morning and welcome everyone to the Koala CoLab conference series for 2021. My name is Jeff Lundy Jenkins and I'm the Director of Southern Wildlife and Koala Operations within the Department of Environment and Science. And I'll be your MC for each of the six separate theme sessions that make up this year's Koala CoLab series. I'd first like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which each of us attends today's virtual event and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their ongoing connection to country and the biodiversity it supports. Today's event is the first of a series of six themed conference sessions split over the next six weeks and builds on the success of the inaugural Koala Colab event that was convened at Lone Pine Sanctuary back in 2018. This year's Koala Colab conference series brings together a diverse range of industry professionals, researchers and community groups to share their knowledge, experiences and research outcomes to establish a basis for more effective collaboration on the threats facing wild koala populations in Queensland. The Queensland Government is committed to hosting further koala collab events every two years to ensure we continue to share our knowledge and experiences to inform and direct our future conservation efforts. This conference series delivers on a key action under the Community Engagement Action Area in the SEQ Koala Conservation Strategy and is founded on the principle that successful koala conservation relies on a collaborative approach across all sectors and communities who have a critical role to play in protecting local koalas. The strategy prescribes that a coordinated and collaborative approach to habitat protection, restoration and threat mitigation is imperative to achieving the targets and halting the decline in koala populations within the life of the strategy and to growing the koala populations in the long term. Today's first session explores the theme of koala mapping, remote sensing and habitat modelling. All of the six sessions run for about two and a half hours. There'll be opportunities uh, to ask questions of the speakers by the live Q&A box that you'll find on your uh, virtual portal screen. These questions will be moderated by me as the MC and in the event that we have more questions and can be accommodated in the allocated question time, we'll arrange for the presenters to be provided with any unanswered questions related to their presentation so that responses can be provided out of session. Before we kick off today's session, there are a couple of important housekeeping matters I need to draw your attention to. When you're in the portal, don't push your back button as this will take you completely out of the on-air platform. Go to the return to timeline to go back to the timeline to view the full agenda and join the various sessions uh, that are available uh, or to go to the meeting hub or to the exhibition. The timings for all the events are in Australian Eastern Standard Time. There is live support available. So just like in a live event, the conference organisers have provided a live concierge service. So just click on the live support red person icon in the top right hand corner of your screen to live chat to one of the support team. This will be monitored by the events team throughout the conference. As I said before, there's also the option for live question and answers. We want to hear your questions. Feel free to ask questions via the Q&A box. Please make sure you enter your questions here rather than in the discussion forum. Otherwise, they may not be seen by me and hence may not be included in the conversation. There is also a like feature on the live Q&A. If someone has asked a question that you are keen to hear the answer to, show your support and it will be moved up the rankings. Um, it, there's also a networking overview. So there's, a, there's an opportunities to meet people at the virtual event. So the meeting hub uh, is available to all delegates and the place where you can connect with other attendees to arrange instant or scheduled meetings. Make sure your profile is up to date and don't forget to accept your connection requests. In order to kick off the event, I now have the, the pleasure to, of introducing Megan Scanlon, uh, MP, the Minister for Environment, and the Great Barrier Reef and the Minister for Science and Youth Affairs. 
Minister Scanlon wasn't available today due to Parliament sitting. Uh, she's prepared a pre-recorded message to launch the Koala Colab 2021 conference series. Minister Scanlon was first elected to the Queensland Parliament in 2018 and was previously served as the Assistant Minister for Tourism Industry Development. In her current portfolio, Minister Scanlon has responsibility for climate change policy, environmental planning and protection policy, the Great Barrier Reef, pollution and waste management, marine and national parks management, science strategy and youth affairs. The implementation of the SEQ Koala Conservation Strategy is a key component of Minister Scanlon's portfolio. I know she was disappointed she couldn't join us personally today, uh, but I'll hand over and uh, you can listen to her recorded message to open the conference. Thank you. Hello everyone, let me begin by respectfully acknowledging the Yagara and Turrbal people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land I'm personally on today. Uh, and as we're connecting from different locations for today's virtual event, I'd also like to acknowledge all traditional owners and custodians across Queensland. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the many individuals and organisations, government departments that contribute to koala conservation in Queensland. Of course, koalas are one of our country's most iconic native species, but we know they face a range of challenges. Those include impacts from high intensity bushfires, climate change, disease, dog attacks, habitat changes and car strikes. And our Palaszczuk government is committed to the protection of koalas and koala habitat. We have introduced the strongest koala protections Queensland has ever seen. These protections have increased both the area and level of protection given to koalas in southeast Queensland. That's been joined by an increased $7.5 million commitment by our government to wildlife hospitals in this year's budget, as well as a focus on designing and delivering infrastructure that emphasises wildlife safety. And that's all underpinned by a strategy backed by science and aimed at ultimately reversing the decline in koala populations, using science and knowledge to generate new ideas and develop new technologies and approaches that can support koala conservation from high quality mapping, monitoring, research programs that can help measure changes in population and threats over time. But obviously, we all need to work together. Successful koala conservation relies on a collaborative approach across all sectors, government, landholders, koala carers, First Nations people, researchers and the community all have a part to play. And the Koala Collab is a great initiative, one that will foster cross-section collaboration and strengthen our partnerships to protect koalas. And I want to thank all of you for your involvement in the program, for your passion, action to help protect this much loved creature. Thank you for taking part in this event and I look forward to hearing about the outcomes of this valuable discussion today. Thanks. Our first presentation uh, in the Koala Collab event uh, for 2021 will be provided by Tim Ryan. Um, Tim leads the Queensland State Government's Ecosystem Survey and Mapping Unit based in the Queensland Herbarium. Um, he has over 26 years of ecosystem survey and mapping experience from both public and private sectors. Tim's team is responsible for producing Queensland's foundational ecosystem related data sets used in a wide range of planning and regulatory frameworks by all levels of government. The data sets include statewide remnant and pre-clearing regional ecosystem mapping, Queensland wetlands mapping, groundwater dependent ecosystems mapping and high value regrowth mapping. Today, Tim will be presenting in relation to regional ecosystem and high value regrowth mapping. So uh, just welcome Tim for his presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Jeff. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here at this year's Koala Collab, and I'm very happy to be presenting to you today on regional ecosystems and high value regrowth mapping. I'd like to just start by pondering a problem quickly. So Queensland's really big. It's over 1.85 million square kilometres in area. We know it's got high biodiversity that includes over 14,000 native plant species and a huge number of fauna species to match. It also is suffering from high developmental pressures with an ever increasing population base. So it brings about the question, 
how do we capture biodiversity related information in a way that facilitates businesses, governments, landholders and organisations to plan for and manage the natural environment. And in Queensland, the answer that, to that question at least begins with the regional ecosystems framework. So in Queensland, the regional ecosystems mapping and framework provides foundational ecosystems research related mapping and information that underpins environmental planning and regulatory processes, including the implementation of state and federal legislations, including the Planning Act, the Veg Management Act, the EP Act, now with koalas on board, the Nature Conservation Act as well, and at a federal level, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So derivatives of the RE mapping can be con constructed to target specific conservation priorities or objectives, such as wetland management for reef water quality um, priorities, or as has been done recently in Southeast Queensland, koala habitat. And that will be the subject of the next talk by Stephen Howe. Um, the RE mapping or derivatives of it are also often used to inform local government planning schemes. So the take home message here is that all three tiers of government rely on the RE mapping framework in some form for the implementation of environmental policy and legislation. So what are regional ecosystems? So regional ecosystems are vegetation communities in a bioregion that are consistently associated with a particular combination of geology, landform and soil. So the classification of vegetation communities as regional ecosystems recognises the interaction between geology, landform, soils and vegetation patterns and hence the way the landscape is broadly functioning. The regional ecosystems also serve as a very good surrogate overall for biodiversity. So many of you in Queensland would already have experienced the RE classification system, but I will just breeze through it um, um, quickly. So REs are made up of three components, the first being the bioregion, the second is land zone, and the third is the vegetation community. Just looking at the first component, bioregion, bioregions are large geographically distinct areas of land within, with common characteristics such as geology, landform patterns, climate patterns, ecological features and plant and animal communities. And in Queensland, we recognise 13 different bioregions. I'm sitting down here in southeast Queensland at the moment, ranges right to the Channel Country out west and north to Cape York Peninsula. The second component to a regional ecosystem is the land zone or sometimes referred to as the substrate. So land zones describe the major geologies and associated landforms and geomorphic processes in Queensland. There are 12 land zones in total. And land zone ones, one to six are our unconsolidated land zones, which are made up primarily of uh, deposits of sand, silt, clay and gravel. I, um, I won't go into the detail of each one of these specifically, I'll just whiz over them, but Land zone one um, areas subject to marine tidal inundation. Land zone two, coastal sand masses, which include our lovely sand islands. Uh, alluvium and river creek flats, uh, land zone three, tertiary clay plains, land zone four, sand plains and deeply weathered landscapes are land zone five and inland dune fields are land zone six. You can see this picture up the top right here is an eroding river bank which is typical of land zone three, alluvia. And here we have land zone five, some old sandy plains, which occupies a lot of central and western Queensland. Just continuing on to land zones seven and 12, these are soils formed in situ on older consolidated rocks, such as land zone seven, lateritic jury crusts, eight are our igneous rocks, nine are fine grain sedimentary rocks, 10 is our medium to coarse grain sedimentary rocks, 
11 is our metamorphosed rocks and 12 are our older igneous rocks. So land zone 10 gives us our lovely sandstone range national parks that go right up through central Queensland. Moving on to the third component, which is vegetation. The vegetation classification focuses on consistent variation in the ecologically dominant layer, or maybe a more simplistic way of putting that is that it focuses on the dominant canopy species. Looking at this example over here on the right, that would be referred to as Brigalow Balar, and the actual grasses or shrubs in the understory, which vary depending on uh, annual conditions or management practices, and typically not used to describe the vegetation. It stays with that dominant upper strata. So now bringing these three components together in this example of 1143, the bioregion is 11, which is Brigalow Belt. The land zone happens to be land zone four, which is gently undulating clay plains. The vegetation, as we said, is Brigalow and Balar. So 1143, bring that together. 1143 is Brigalow, Balar, shrubby open forest on clay plains. Simple. So scale is critical to both the classification and the mapping. You see the diagram on the right here, the sandy color. That indicates the area that's mapped at a one is to 100,000 scale. And, and as you can see, it covers most of Queensland. The yellow areas are mapped at one is to 50,000 scale. And then you can see a few local government areas down here in the southeast corner are mapped as one is to 25,000 scale. So most of the state is mapped at one is to 100,000 scale. Just to give you an idea, one millimetre on the map at 100,000 scale equals 100 metres on the ground. And that imposes certain map limits. We have minimum remnant patch sizes of five hectares at 100,000 scale and minimum width for linear features of 75 metres. Now, that's reasonably coarse and it's fine for Western Queensland, but as you might imagine, when we get into the more populous Eastern parts of the state where we're trying to manage delicate uh, or, or um, specific conservation aspects, koala habitat, for example, we're actually looking for better scale of mapping. And that's the reason why some of those Southeast Queensland LGAs are mapped at one is to 25,000. Because at one is to 25,000, one millimetre on the map equals 25 metres on the ground. And its map limits are much reduced in that a minimum patch size can be uh, a quarter of a hectare. And we actually match minimum map minimum widths of linear features down to 20 metres. So if you take a, a large mature eucalypt tree, you know, often that has 10 to 15 metre uh, crown width. So we're really getting down to almost one to two crown widths that we're mapping. The RE mapping itself largely centres around the pre-clearing extent. So the pre-clearing extent of regional ecosystems is based on old aerial photographs and other supporting resources. The pre-clearing vegetation or regional ecosystem is defined as the vegetation that is present before it was cleared or what would have been there without clearing. So here we have an example of an old aerial photograph that the pre-clearing boundaries have been manually marked up on. And that gets scanned and digitally transferred into a GIS that's overlain over um, ortho-rectified high-resolution satellite imagery. And you can see the common features here from the manually marked up photo now in the completed pre-clearing regional ecosystems map. The delineation of the veg patterns on historical aerial photographs is done using stereoscopic pairs of photographs, which give us, gives us a 3D view of the landscape there's me with my trusty stereoscope. This stereoscope, it's very old technology, but it's just tried and proven. It's extremely reliable and works very well. Then of course, the vegetation patterns that we delineate on those air photos are used in conjunction with field survey, geology and soils information, 
as well as ecological and historical knowledge to define and map the pre-clearing regional ecosystems. And really in these last two slides, I've just shown you there's an entire mapping methodology based around this. I'm really just skimming the surface for the purposes of this talk. Um, there is a methodology document, which I have links for at the end of the presentation, if, if you wanna go into that in further detail. The other thing that we have in our bag of tricks, um, and this is used specifically for areas that may have been cleared for a hundred years or more, you know, prior to our earliest uh, historical aerial photography. And that is the old survey plans from when Queensland was first broken up by surveyors. This particular example I have here is from 1889. It's situated down the Gold Coast along the Narang Creek. And you can see what the surveyor is marked here, dense scrub and then gum and apple uh, black soil forest. And then they very nicely delineated the boundary between the two for me. So that boundary is, you know, you wouldn't treat that as gospel, but it's still a, a very useful guide when, when reconstructing the landscape for regional ecosystems. Obviously, this is a very time consuming process to look at every parcel of land. So we haven't done it for all of Queensland. It's mainly reserved for those areas where we have no other sources of information available because it's been cleared for so long. Okay, moving on to remnant RE mapping. So this is a very mouthy definition. Remnant woody vegetation is defined as vegetation that has not been cleared or vegetation that has been cleared, but where the dominant canopy has regrown so that 70% of the height and at least 50% of the cover relative to the undisturbed height and cover of that stratum and is dominated by species characteristic of the vegetation's undisturbed canopy. So as I said, that's a bit mouthy. So let's, let's work through that with a diagram. So first of all, on the left here, we have an intact forest that's never been cleared. So regardless of its canopy height and cover, because it's never been cleared, it is remnant. The example on the right here, it's the same vegetation type, you can see the trees are shorter and less, uh, there's, more, there's more spacing between them. So it's been cleared in the past, but it has regrown to the point where there is greater than 50% of the original ecosystem's canopy cover and more than 70% of the original ecosystem's canopy height. So that vegetation would also be classified as remnant. Now looking at, this example down here on the bottom left, where this vegetation has been cleared, it's regrowing, it has the canopy cover, but it has not yet attained 70% of the original canopy height. So that would be non-remnant. And this example here, it has not attained 50% of the original canopy cover. So that is also non-remnant. Okay, so once we've got our pre-clearing, the remnant boundaries are mapped and effectively cookie cut into the pre-clearing to produce a remnant RE map. So here's our completed pre-clearing map with its REs allocated to each polygon. Then we construct this remnant, non-remnant cover layer. The remnant bits here being in green and the yellow is the areas that are non-remnant. That's then intersected or cookie cut with the pre-clearing to then give us our remnant regional ecosystems mapping. So all these yellow bits here on our uh, cover layer translate into non-remnant regional ecosystems over here. There's no RE allocated to those areas. And of course, by having the pre-clearing and remnant RE extents to compare with we can then generate all sorts of tree clearing statistics. And this is one of the real strengths of the RE framework. Many jurisdictions, both nationally and internationally, have some really great remnant vegetation mapping, but none have reliable pre-clearing mapping to do this sort of detailed analysis with. So we can do comprehensive breakdowns 
of all regional ecosystems, and they're available currently on the DES website uh, by sub-region, catchment, natural resource management area, local government area, electoral district, and they're just to name a few. Of course, you can do whatever breakdown you like once you've got those base input data sets. And then the other strength of this with having that sort of information and tree clearing statistics, we can then allocate what's called Vegetation Management Act class and biodiversity status, which is used under the various state uh, government planning here in Queensland. So REs are individually assigned a class for Vegetation Management Act purposes based on how much of their mapping or the, of their mapped pre-clearing extent has been cleared. For example, if there's less than 10% of pre-clearing area remaining, that would be considered an endangered regional ecosystem. If there's 10 to 30% of a pre-clearing area remaining, it would be of concern and greater than 30% remaining least concern. So looking at these two maps here on the right, we have a pre-clearing RE map based around the Brisbane area and a corresponding remnant RE map based around Brisbane. You can see the pink areas are the endangered, orange is of concern and green areas are least concern. And logically you can see all, well, most of the pink areas that were mapped on the pre-clear have been cleared on the remnant map and hence the reason why there's less than 10% of those REs remaining. Moving on to biodiversity status, it uses these same tree clearing based concepts, but it introduces information about degradation or threatening processes that may be going on within each of these regional ecosystems. So biodiversity status for use under the Queensland's Environmental Protection Act, it can never be less than what the uh, Veg Management Act class is, but if there is a threatening process going on, it can in fact be elevated in status. And we do our remnant extents every two years, and we have done so since 1997. So we can generate all sorts of clearing trend over time. This is the average annual clearing rate of remnant regional ecosystems from 97 to 2019. You can see here back in the bad old days before the introduction of the Vegetation Management Act in Queensland, there was some pretty high tree clearing rates. It was 2000 when the VMA, the Veg Management Act was actually enacted. And you can see the resultant drop in tree clearing over time right down to a low from in 09 through to about 2013. In about 2013, things kicked up a little bit and that's often referred to as the Campbell Newman bump. Um, and then in recent times, it's declined again, which is a, a good sign. Um, this is another way of looking at clearing over time. Uh, the darker colors here represent greater tree clearing rates. So this is the rate of clearing since uh, 1997 through to 2019. And I mean, you can really observe how overall there's been significant clearing in the southeastern quarter of the state, including Brigalow Belt, Southeast Queensland, New England Tableland, and eastern parts of the Mulgolan bioregions. Um, Here's another way of looking at it, percentage of remnant regional ecosystems remaining overall in Queensland by subregions. The New England Tableland has the lowest extent of remnant vegetation out of Queensland's 13 bioregions at 36%. The Brigalow Belt bioregion has the second lowest remnant extent at 41%. And the Tara Downs and Taroom subregions, which are these two small uh, subregions, have the lowest sub-regional remnant extent in Queensland with only 5.9 and 6.95 respectively. So very highly cleared landscapes. So I've spoken a lot about remnant regional ecosystems, but what happens to that vegetation which doesn't quite make it to remnant status? That's where high value regrowth mapping comes in. So here's another very mouthy 
uh, definition under the Veg Management Act of what high value regrowth is, but it can basically be summarised as non-remnant native vegetation that hasn't been cleared for greater than 15 years. And in actual fact, that can be quite reliably mapped from remote imagery, often without the need for ground surveys, as unlike the remnant criteria, there's no height criteria. So um, the only problem we face with applying this, um, this definition is, uh, is the identification of exotic vegetation. Most of the time we can see exotics with high resolution imagery, but um, not always when high resolution imagery is not available. So here's an example. You can see all these very well vegetated areas. They're all remnant and that's captured under our remnant RE mapping. But then we've got all this additional high value regrowth throughout the landscape captured now as well. And this is the sort of thing we're capturing. You can see we've got trees which are, they're greater than 15 years old, but you can see this doesn't have the intact nature of remnant vegetation yet. However, that still has a lot of habitat value and it is returning to a, uh, a broadly functioning ecosystem. And that's what high value regrowth is really trying to capture. There is one minimum requirement for high value regrowth, and that is a minimum crown cover. So if an ecosystem was originally a sparse regional ecosystem, and we know that from our pre-clearing regional ecosystems mapping, um, then you would need at least a minimum of 10% cover to qualify as high value regrowth. So just for example, looking at these photos to our right here, this top example, you can see there's reasonable canopy cover coming in, still very young juvenile trees, but if they were over 15 years old, that would qualify as high value regrowth. This example below it, where we have well-spaced scattered trees, well, that probably wouldn't. So what's next for the REs and HVR program? Well, we're currently trying to improve both remnant and HVR extent by reconciling with a new product produced by the Queensland Remote Sensing Centre, which is a new woody vegetation layer. That's, that relies on the 30 year Landsat satellite history and reliably picks up woody vegetation over all of Queensland. We will be reconciling our remnant and HVR layers with that additional information. We're always looking to improve the RE map scale, as I mentioned, particularly in coastal areas and in what we might describe hotspots, such as the Southeast Queensland Koala Plan area. Uh, we're using high resolution imagery and other information to reduce the number of REs per polygon. You would have seen in some of my example slides through this presentation, an RE can have, sorry, a polygon can have more than one RE in it. That's okay in some instances, but it's not useful in others. So we are endeavouring to divide those up to have more homogeneous mapping of REs. And then we also have a focus in um, the Great Barrier Reef on wetlands at the moment for the purposes of the reef water quality improvement plan. So that's basically where we're heading just at present. Um, if any of you are interested in any of what I've spoken about in this presentation, here's a whole bunch of useful links here, um, which you can grab from the presentation. And yeah, thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, really appreciate the presentation and the background with regards to the technical detail that goes into mapping vegetation in Queensland as an important underlay for the development of the koala habitat mapping. We've uh, got a number of questions that have come through on the Q&A um, app, and that's uh, a lot of those are focused actually on the koala mapping itself rather than on the vegetation mapping. Um, uh, so I'm, not propo I'm proposing not that, we, not that we don't address those questions, but potentially hold those questions over to be to be answered by Stephen, because a number of those relate to um, why certain areas aren't reflected in the koala mapping and uh, why some areas aren't protected. Um, what, I, what I might in fact do is I'll, I'll address a couple of the questions myself. Um, one of the questions relates to um, 
the, the mapping has been changed to accommodate development over years. For example, 800 hectares of Oki Flat Road um, in Narangbar was classified as KMA, uh, never to be developed in the Koala Management Plan in 2006. And three years later, there was not a tree left due to development. So what is the value of the mapping? So I think my response to that is, is very much that the Queensland government based on the SEQ koala uh, population study identified that there were continuing declines in koala populations despite the measures that were in place. And that was the basis for establishing the koala expert panel. One of the key recommendations of the koala expert panel was for the need for more comprehensive and consistent mapping of koala habitat across southeast Queensland. And that was the um, impetus for the current mapping, which has now was introduced in February in 2020. And that mapping, which is based on the regional ecosystem mapping that Tim and his team produce, now identifies and maps the best quality koala habitat in southeast Queensland in a consistent manner. And cons at the same time that that mapping was introduced, there was also introduced new planning controls, which now provide protections for koala habitat identified in koala priority areas, where there's koala habitat and locally refined koala habitat. So yes, there was recognition by the Queensland government that under uh, previous arrangements that koala habitat continued to be lost and koala habitats declined that's been addressed through the expert panel recommendations and the subsequent development of the new state of the art koala mapping, which Stephen will discuss in the next presentation. There's a couple of questions with regards to um, areas of koala habitat that are excluded or haven't been covered in local government areas, despite the fact that koalas have been identified in those sites. What I can I guess address in response to those particular questions is that again, uh, local government across South East Queensland have been very vocal in representing to the Queensland government that there are areas within their jurisdictions that they uh, were previously protected that may not be protected now and other areas that they believe warrant protection because of the presence of koalas or the presence of habitat they believe is important to support the persistence of koalas in their local government areas. In recognition of that um, concern, uh, the Department of Environment and Science is currently working with local governments on a project um, to develop some technical guidance around other mechanisms to protect koala habitat um, at a local scale. So for those that are aware of the planning framework, currently the koala habitat mapping represents a matter of state environmental significance but planning regulations don't allow us to represent the same or essentially the similar matter as a matter of local environmental significance. So there's currently work between the department and local governments to look at other mechanisms to identify and protect local, locally significant koala habitat in those local government areas. So um, in the most recent update of koala habitat mapping, a number of locally refined koala habitat areas were um, recognised and converted to core koala habitat in the new mapping. Again, this was through a process of engagement with local governments, um, collection and analysis of data collected by local governments to support that. So I'll also provide those questions to Stephen so that he can address some of the issues in those. Um, Got a question here, I think, which I think does um, uh, is related to uh, Tim's area. So there's a, there's a question here that says, the system of conservation classification is highly flawed as it effectively allows particular ecosystem to be cleared to a point where in some instances, especially in highly urbanized areas, it becomes unviable and thereby only sort of 10% remaining before it is afforded protection under the legislation. Ironically, we are attempting to provide greater protection to high value non-remnant as opposed to in situ remnant. So I'm not sure if Tim has a, a, a thought in relation to that. Uh, well, what I think that might be getting 
to is the um, the urban exemption of regional ecosystems. It's not true to say that something needs to be endangered before protection mechanisms kick in. The Vegetation Management Act actually regulates broad scale clearing of all um, vegetation management class ecosystems. So you need permits to clear um, and you, there are only very limited circumstances in which a permit will be given. However, when it comes to urban areas, there is an exemption that only endangered regional ecosystems are protected under the Vegetation Management Act. The point I'd like to raise there is that the Veg Management Act is only one form of mechanism or one mechanism to protect that vegetation. And as we now have the koala plan um, and the mapping that Stephen will talk about, that protects habitat or regardless of status. And um, all it needs to be is a, a koala habitat RE and either be high value regrowth or remnant vegetation. The actual endangered of concern or least concern status is, is not pertinent to, or relevant to that argument. Relates more specifically to Tim's uh, habitat mapping. And the, the question is, you discuss regrowth habitat that had reached a couple of thresholds, 50% canopy cover, 70% canopy height. Yes. Um, would you be able to uh, class where, where uh, the vegetation would be classified as a remnant? Could you talk through the process by which that occurs and whether that new remnant vegetation is included in your clearing rates data? Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the latter part of that is new remnant in our clearing data. Yes, it is, but it is not as thorough currently as what a removals or losses of vegetation is. So in other words, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of effort put into the mapping and capture of the loss of remnant vegetation. Not a cons commensurate amount has been put in to map the re-establishing vegetation as it regrows in the landscape. But there is a whole new program called the Enhanced Slats Program, which has been designed and built around tackling that particular aspect. And we're already looking at, well, we, we already do add some remnant or newly established remnant back in, but we will be doing it more thoroughly in a statewide manner when we have the new remotely sensed products coming out of that enhanced slats program, which actually mm, sort of maps and monitors the re-establishment of vegetation over time in Queensland. So there will be considerably, it'll be a, a balanced effort then that all vegetation change, both the losses and the gains will be accurately reflected in the regional ecosystems map. Now, how we actually do that, um, as I said, we will use that remotely sensed product. Determining whether something meets that 50, 70 cutoff, it can be problematic because to be absolutely certain about the height and criteria, that's not something we can get yet from remotely sensed data across the state. So you do need on ground information and that's usually provided um, by a, a PMAV sort of process. If an area is inadequately mapped, that information can be provided by a property map of accessible vegetation, which can then address that uh, newly established remnant on any given property. Yeah, welcome back everyone. Um, the second presentation for today's session of the Koala Colab 2021 will be provided by Stephen Howell. Stephen is the manager of the biodiversity assessment team within the Queensland Herbarium. The team's responsible for the objective spatial assessment of terrestrial and aquatic conservation values across Queensland using the best available science and methodologies to inform decision making for a range of purposes and at a range of scales. The team's focused on habitat modelling for a number of threatened species, and in particular koalas, for which 
They have mapped koala habitat areas across southeast Queensland using modelling based on the latest regional ecosystem high value regrowth mapping, as uh, discussed by Tim Ryan in the previous presentation, koala sightings and biophysical measures. Stephen's a landscape ecologist with a focus on spatial ecology and an interest in rainforest ecology. Um, so welcome Stephen to present this morning on koala habitat model and results. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, I'm uh, Stephen Howe. I look after the biodiversity assessment team. We're part of the Queensland Herbarium within the Department of Environment Science. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the koala habitat areas, KHAs, give you a little bit of uh, history, then go through the methodology of how these were areas were developed and then have a look at the results. Um, I'll also talk about um, locally refined koala habitat areas, LRKHAs, uh, and then depending on where I'm going with time, uh, I'll touch on the koala priority areas, KPAs, and the koala habitat restoration areas, the KHRAs. So, so sorry about all the, all the abbreviations. So a little bit of history about the habitat mapping. So development of the new mapping was recommended by the koala panel in 2017. Um, and the recommendation was to develop consistent mapping for koala habitat across SCQ at a fine resolution that addressed some of the issues of the previous mapping um, and also implements a systematic mechanism for updating this mapping for accuracy and uh, for tracking of changes in time, uh, over time. So the recommendation was supported um, and it was implemented by uh, the government. So, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today is, is the habitat uh, mapping. So just a little bit about habitat mapping, just to give it a bit of background to how we've done this. So um, for a lot of the work that we do um, and the habitat mapping slash modeling that we have, uh, we take the buffered species points so, um, and we assign that as being habitat. So we take the species records and we get those from corporate databases and a range of other databases. And I'll talk specifically about the koalas uh, data sources in a tick. But we get, we get the records from uh, various databases uh, and we apply a number of validation and filtering rules. So get rid of old records, imprecise records, cultivator records, um, sightings of um, birds that have just flown over when it's not really habitat, it's just a bird flying around. So we get rid of a lot of those types of records. Then we put a, um, a buffer around it and we say any vegetation within that buffer is habitat for that species. Uh, and that's not too bad. In the absence of any other information, at least we're identifying and hopefully protecting the habitat surrounding those uh, particular records. Um, but our preference definitely is to create these habitat suitability models. Uh, and so that's where you have core habitat that's based on vegetation, but also other biophysical data. Um, these are more ecologically accurate, um, but they are more time consuming. They do take longer to create, longer to um, run especially when you're creating these models that it's getting into something statutory that's actually going to say to someone, you can't clear there because this model says that. Um, so we need to make sure that they're robust enough um, to be able to feed into those types of processes and be um, suitable for that. So, so what we'd like to do, so you just see this little um, point there. So say that there was a, a record um, found in this particular location. So once again, not koalas, but there's a record there. So under this, um, the buffered species points, we put a buffer around that and then we would select all the vegetation that falls within that buffer. So this particular species actually um, likes the riparian vegetation that's associated with this stream going through here. Um, and so by doing this method, it's picked up the habitat close to that species record, but it's also picked up habitat that's quite a fair distance away. And when we're looking to identify core habitat, to protect that core habitat, um, then that gets a little bit harder to, um, to justify. So our preference really is to identify that as being the core habitat for that species. And that's what those habitat models give us, is a way of identifying those. Uh, then we're able to remove that point because we're just trying to avoid um, duplication doubling up. But one of the other real strengths of this is we're also able to identify that that's core habitat. So that additional area up here, that additional stream, and perhaps even these other streams over the other area, are also core habitat. Even though there were no records found in that particular area, it has all the right attributes. So the vegetation, the biophysical attributes, etc., that we would consider it to be um, core habitat for that particular species. 
So this habitat suitability model, that's what I'm um, going to go through um, now. So for the koalas, so it's built on the existing, we did already have a, a habitat model for um, the southern part of SEQ. Uh, based on contemporary methodologies, the best available science and data, uh, based on regionally consistent and high value regrowth. So it's based on the excellent work from, um, from Tim and his team um, that he went through previously. Um, it's tenure independent, optimizes the use of existing data and information, uh, transparent and repeatable, and that's really important. So we really need to be able to uh, make sure that people understand how the methodology and how the information uh, came together. And it's also a decision support tool. So when I'm starting off talking about this habitat model, it is just about a habitat model. Then it turns into something that is applied through the VMA or um, through matters of state environmental significance. So it is a decision support tool that feeds into those planning, that planning and regulatory environment. Uh, so just having a look koala, so these are koala records across Queensland, uh, outside the SEQ bioregion. Uh, these are those buffered filtered records and they just have a circle placed around them uh, just to um, identify habitat and show where they are. Northern part of the SEQ bioregion, we have an existing model, but I'm really going to focus on the southern part of the bioregion, which is where we've updated um, and run this new model. So, so that's the area that we're looking at. So I'm just highlighted by the local government areas, just to give you a bit of context. Um, this is the SEQ, shaping SEQ, the SEQ 20 um, planning area that we've done this habitat model. Uh, and uh, honestly, we don't actually like doing habitat models based on planning boundaries. Um, we re would really prefer to do a habitat model based on ecological boundaries, at least the bioregional boundary, uh, and preferably the full extent of the koala um, of a particular species, and obviously in this case, koalas. Um, but unfortunately that wasn't possible at this time and certainly to do it for the northern part of the bioregion and all of SEQ is on our agenda, but there's a significant amount of work involved. Um, the methodology that we've developed and I'll go through in a sec, uh, we're hoping actually can be applied um, to other areas across Queensland with just changes to the input parameters uh, and things that become important as you move out west or as you go north. So this is a habitat model, it has the components. Um, Maxent, the buffer records and regional ecosystems get classified and create the remnant and pre-clearing and then turns into the koala habit areas. So just teasing that apart a little bit and quickly going through this. So we rank the regional ecosystems um, based on the presence and relative dominance of trees that are important for koalas. So it's based on expert knowledge, published, published literature, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually do this for pre-clear and current and remnant vegetation. So that gives us a way of um, identifying how much there used to be and how much there is uh, now. Uh, so just an example. So this is from the technical reports available on the web um, where regional ecosystem 1233 um, is you can put tree and cornice woodland and there's a whole stack of information as Tim would have alluded to that goes um, associated with um, with that um, description that's been rated as high uh, whereas something like co complex notable vine forest will bring on rainforest um, that's been um, ranked as being very low in terms of its importance for koalas Okay, so we have that ranking for all the regional ecosystems across southeast Queensland from high to um, medium, low, very low, and non habitat. Then we bring in the buffered koala records, uh, and that comes from existing corporate databases, the DARE systematic survey data, koala based local governments, uh, ALA, Atlas of Living Australia, etc. We apply those filters, uh, and in this case, we lost about, well, lost is a bad word, but we, um, about 20% of the records didn't pass the filters. In this case, we had the date um, um, as there and the precision, we've got rid of duplicates and a range of other filters were, um, ecological filters were applied. So we ended up with 88,000 odd records. So it's not 88,000 koalas in Southeast Queensland. Um, that's just how many records we have that passed all those filtering rules during that time period. Just gives you a bit of an idea of the distribution of um, where the koala records are and the data sources, once again, this is from uh, the technical report. Okay, so then we have within the matrix where there is or is not a koala record. Final component of the, of the matrix is Maxent. So this is a commonly used statistical tool uh, looking at species distribution modeling. Um, and I guess the easiest way to explain Maxent is that we gave the program a number of variables like soil, nitrogen, phosphorus, slope, elevation, 
rainfall, etc. And we gave it those koala records you saw before, and we told Maxim to look for associations between those two. So what best explains where the koala records um, were found? Um, and so what this table is once again in the report also says that elevation was the thing that most explained where the koala records were um, across the landscape. So it doesn't so elevation wasn't weighted, um, but it just says that elevation is most likely going to be a proxy for some of the other drivers of the distribution. So uh, it was considered a useful variable. So we've got that max sense, and we've got that from low, medium, and high. We have the koala records, where there's one there or not, and then we have the regional ecosystems as part of it. We then classified that um, into a range of um, categories, um, and we can then map that because we've attributed that to the vegetation. So we've got the remnant, uh, and we've got the pre-clearing. So having a look up in the top left-hand corner here in the tens, um, so these are areas where it has the right environmental variables, it has records, um, and it also has the right regional ecosystems. Uh, then down in the bottom right hand corner where there's ones, so it doesn't have the right sort of environmental variables through Maxent, there are no koala records, and it's non-habitat. So sand, sands um, or mangroves or something like that, so it's non-habitat for koalas. Um, Okay, so we've got that matrix. So that's our starting point that fed into the SEQ koala conservation strategy. We've reclassified that to identify core, non-core, and non-habitat. And there's the definitions associated um, with those. So I won't go through those, but um, that just gives you um, the breakdown of that core, non-core, and non-habitat. And the core component is what's fed into uh, the SEQ strategy. So it's that final step. Um, in the, with uh, that map at the end, so the quail habitat areas version two. Okay, so this is what the, the map looks like and the results, and we can actually break it down by looking at remnant and regrowth. So regrowth is a little bit hard to see, but it's just that lighter colored uh, green. Um, and it just shows you that's the full amount that we've identified currently for koala habitat areas. Um, it's worthwhile just having a look at that's how much there used to be of that core koala tap, which is a bit of a scary map having a look at seeing how much there is now versus how much there is uh, there used to be. Um, the other useful thing to look at um, is that we can then, within that sort of matrix there, we can break it down a little bit more uh, and we can have a look at what are the best of the best areas. So even within those areas of core, those ones up in the top right left hand corner have the best environmental um, variables, uh, they have a record and they have eucalyptus tree corners, all the best REs considered important for um, koalas. Um, so just having a look at the numbers, so easiest one to have a look at someone on the right hand side, so how much there used to be, uh, and then the next one shows um, how much there is, how much has been cleared, how much is left of regrowth, and then how much is left of a remnant. So it's been peer reviewed, the methodology, so um, by Sire Land and Water, and the review is supportive of the modeling, modeling approach. Um, and they said that the method improves on current methods for identifying koala habitat by incorporating different knowledge sources into a useful tool that were made. Repeatable mapping, and that repeatable mapping is quite important because we repeat this um, at the moment every year um, and it gets released. And that's what this was. So. Version 2 was released on the 8th of September, along with a range of other um, updates to um, other products. Based on RE version 12, uh, we did a quick review of the REs that changed between versions and new REs that might have come in. High value regrowth, um, did a review of high value regrowth just to make sure it was better attributed. Um, we included the latest koala sightings we had up until the time. We didn't update Maxent. So those environmental variables like soil, and elevation, that type of stuff, won't change that much. Um, so we're looking to actually run Maxent every five years, uh, and that will then get updated and included in the model. But the model at the moment um, and the release into these products is running on a yearly schedule. So quickly, the locally refined koala habitat areas. Um, so the transition responsibility from koala conservation to state government, uh, from local government, sorry, to state government. Um, these would provide continuous regulatory protection for all these areas for two years, a two year period. Um, local governments are asked to provide these areas to form part of the kind of conservation efforts. 
and where they were outside what we'd already identified as being koala habitat areas, um, they were included and they were clipped to any remnant and high value regrowth. So it doesn't matter whether it was a koala or um, remnant or high value regrowth, it was any remnant or high value regrowth. So just looking at the combination of the two, the koala habitat areas and locally refined koala habitat areas. Um, so it sees an apparent reduction in the area, although there was an increase in the amount that was in uh, KHA. Um, and that reduction was really about continuing refinements to the habitat model and the um, uh, source mapping through the regional ecosystems and high value regrowth. But over time, it's expected that development restrictions will result in reduced habitat clearing as well as allowing uh, areas to regenerate. So they regenerate, they become high value regrowth. And if they meet those other components of the model, then they get included in the model. So results are included in SEQ conservation strategy. They're included in the Vegetation Management Act of Central Habitat, and they're included in matters of state environmental significance. Uh, and these also get into a range of other planning systems. And I won't go through um, those just there. Results are available from the website, um, from the Queensland Globe, from uh, the VMA report. Um, there's a separate section in the VMA report to get that. But you can also download the GIS results from QSpatial. So you get all the GIS results and you get all the information and the attributes associated with it, um, how to color it, um, metadata, et cetera, associated with that. So that covers off the koala habitat areas and the locally refined um, koala habitat areas. Uh, I've only got a few moments left, so I'll just quickly touch on the priority areas and the restoration areas. So priority areas were about um, identifying management areas containing core habitat, but minimal threats. So they had to have the best habitat that we, that we could identify, but the least amount of threats. Um, and so we had the habitat model, and that's the same one you saw before, just broken down by those individual categories. Um, we then had some threats, constraints, opportunities, and resilience mapping. So a range of criteria here that we mapped and we identified uh, ecological cost. So we had habitat, ecological cost, ran it through um, MarkSan, so that's not MaxSan, that's MarkSan um, software. And that tries to identify the most amount of habitat for the least amount of threats and the most amount of opportunities. Uh, it tries to find that balance between uh, the two. And that's what you're looking at the right-hand side. From that one on the right-hand side, it turned into that map. Um, once we uh, consolidate some of the boundaries, aggregate the parcels, snap the cadaster, et cetera. And um, that's the, where the koala priority areas uh, were identified or how the pri koala priorities were identified. So the other component of that is the koala habitat restoration areas, KHRAs. So this is about cleared, highly suitable habitat. So this is where it used to be really important um, koala habitat, but it no longer is important koala habitat because it's been cleared. Uh, and if you were looking to maybe do some restoration activities, this might be a good place to start. So this isn't a statutory layer. Uh, this doesn't say you have to do this, we have to do that. But it does give you a bit of a guide as to if you had to choose between two different areas, this would probably be a good one to start with because it used to be really important um, koala habitat. So it's only an indicative um, layer. Won't go through this, but a similar process. We had um, what, the, how much there used to be, the ecological cost layer based on threats, etc., through MarkSan, and then identified those areas um, that were perhaps suitable for koala habitat restoration uh, areas. Uh, so just finally, just like to say thanks. So the koala expert panel, uh, thanks for instigating and guiding us through this. Uh, at the time when we were developing the model, we uh, formed a separate um, koala advisory group that just helped us um, with the development of the model, um, but especially thanks to the biodiversity assessment team. So Harriet, Courtney, uh, myself and Lindsay, so current members of the team um, and um, who have been involved with um, the model from the start, but also there's a range of staff that have been involved with, um, with the team and specifically with development of, of the koala model um, over time. Uh, and that's everything. technical nature, some of a, of a broader nature. Um, one of the ones I might just touch on that arose during Tim's session was um, a question with regards to why it would be that um, certain coastal habitats, and the example was some of the, the lowland areas in, in Redlands, um, local government area, why might they be 
not included in the koala habitat mapping, even though there's knowledge that koalas use those areas and um, there's records to support that. So there's definitely um, a lot of records and, and I say a lot of knowledge and information um, about areas that koalas use outside our habitat mapping. Um, because we needed to feed our mapping into statutory products like the Vegetation Management Act and the Matters of State Environmental Significance, uh, we were bound by the base inputs into that. So the regional ecosystems and the high value regrowth that um, fed into those is what we had to attribute and include and identify as core habitat. Uh, so there's two, two possible reasons why areas might not get picked up. It could be that there's no regional ecosystem or high value regrowth mapping in that particular area. Uh, even though there's koalas and there are scattered trees and koalas do move from one area to the other, uh, independent of where the vegetation is. Uh, or it could be that the vegetation um, isn't the right vegetation to be included as that high, medium or low um, that we've identified as being important for koalas. There's a couple of technical questions around the use of Maxent. So, um, one is uh, even though Maxent is the most widely used model um, for species distribution modeling, uh, is it worth using multiple models and averaging based on um, the ALKI coefficient or is it really um, much of a muchness? So I guess the question uh, is. Yes, so it's, an it's a good question. It's an interesting question. Uh, we did, um, you're right, there are other models around and even within Maxent, there are a number of variables and things that you can apply uh, to Maxent. So we did explore a number of those models um, before we settled on uh, using Maxent, but we just um, felt that that gave us the, the best output based on the information and the scale and the type of work that, that we were doing. So. Um, so certainly uh, when we rerun Max in, in uh, that five year period, which is I think only about two years away, um, we will rerun it and we will look again at the input parameters and some of the um, variables and also stuff that we chose when we, when we ran it. So, yeah. Okay, another, another Maxent related question uh, was, um, did you do any sensitivity analysis comparisons with other species distribution modeling algorithms? Um, also, uh, the regional ecosystem classification, um, the comment from the question is that is it's pretty subjective. For instance, I would have thought the presence of E. robusta would make 12.3.4 pretty popular for koalas. So surprised you've only listed it as low ranking. Is there a full list of these classifications published somewhere? So there's, there's two parts to that. Um, did you do sensitivity analysis? And then the question around um, the, the subjective nature of the RE and how um, those classifications were derived and, and whether there's a list of those. Uh, so in terms of the second part, um, the, if you have a look at the technical document, so that's available on that Koala website that I talked about, but it's also available through the QSpatial download package. But in that technical document, there's an appendix, there's a section there explaining um, how we identified those um, regional ecosystems. And there's an appendix listing at the bottom, listing all those 200 something odd REs that are found. So it's the root REs and all those individual sub um, type REs uh, and the rankings that we applied uh, to them. So all that information is uh, listed in the in the technical report. So, and as I said, that's available just from that Koala website. You don't have to download the GIS package. Um, we did do a bit of a comparison with other um, models, um, and we did look at. Uh, so there's an online system where you can load up your data, and it uses Maxent type um, um, uh, programming to do it. And we did have a look at some of the outcomes of that. Um, we did do a sensitivity analysis, and we did actually have some records just as an aside so we had some records that weren't included in the model and we were able to the maxing component and we were able to use that to help sort of back cross validate the outputs um, from the maxent results and we were quite confident that um, those records weren't used in the model but when we ran the model the model actually identified those areas covered by those records as being um, important habitat as being high in terms of maxent um, we did use the high and the medium categories of Maxent, so um, it meant that if there was any sort of uncertainty in what the results were coming from Maxent, uh, I guess we were a little bit more, more precautionary by using those top two categories. 
Okay, um, again, there's a lot of interest and some other questions there. And as I said in the introduction, we'll seek to provide responses to those other questions yep. offline. Um, really grateful for Stephen taking the time to give that presentation today. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome back to the third session uh, for today's Koala CoLab conference series. Our third presentation today will be done by Harriet Priest. Harriet is a conservation analyst with the biodiversity assessment team um, within the Queensland Department of Environment and Science. She's got extensive experience in wildlife ecology, threatened species monitoring, spatial modelling and links between science and policy. Uh, Harriet's a spatial ecologist currently working on the science that underpins koala conservation and played a very instrumental role in developing the new approach to habitat mapping that's been utilised for the SEQ koala conservation strategy. Harriet's been a ranger with national parks across Australia and begun monitoring koala populations to support the first state planning policy back in 1995. She was a co-author of a University of Queensland report on the status of koala populations in SEQ, which used more than 20 years of monitoring data to quantify declines in the koala populations of up to 80%. This morning, Harriet will be presenting in relation to the koala threat hotspot mapping. So thanks very much, Harriet. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Jeff and uh, Jeff and I go way back, I've known him for a long time. Uh, yeah, so today we'd like to talk about the threat mapping component that follows on from the work that Stephen has just presented in terms of the koala habitat modelling. And this presentation is a lot of, uh, uh, based on a lot of the work that um, Leonie Seabrook has done for us. So we're going to start off with a bit of background about the koala population decline um, and, and how that's led to the koala conservation strategy. And then moving on to how much progress we've made to date in reviewing the key threats and what our next steps might be in, in terms of modelling the threats, including koala occurrence, how we're going to combine the threat layers how we're going to link that to other programs, and uh, then finally, any questions? So, I'm going to just start off with a brief background, and that's the recognition that uh, koala populations are in decline across southeast Queensland, and in, in fact, uh, across um, uh, all of uh, New South Wales and Queensland. And our report um, that I worked with Jonathan Rhodes at the University of Queensland and, and others uh, showed that we have this 80% decline in the population uh, between 1996 and 2014 in the Koala Coast, and then a 50% decline in the Pine Rivers local government area uh, as it was back then. So that report precipitated uh, a number of state government initiatives, including the Koala Expert Panel, which uh, morphed, I suppose, into the Koala Advisory Council. And that led to the habitat suitability, suitability modelling that Stephen has just talked about. And of course, the new SEQ conservation strategy. So in that strategy that uh, has just been released uh, last year, there's a number of action areas. So six action areas altogether. First one being habitat protection. Second one is habitat restoration the mapping, monitoring, research and reporting, community engagement, and then partnerships and strategic coordination. The threat management component, of course, links to all of those action areas. So the action area four is where we're undertaking this threat mapping. And the idea here is to identify the koala threats and developing uh, and enable us to develop a, um, a mapping methodology. And then uh, we, this would enable us to track changes in the threats over time and hopefully to uh, enable other groups to institute some mitigation strategies. Action area three, which is the, um, the threat management component, you can see from the highlights here that the, the uh, a large number of uh, components of threats have been discussed here. 
So uh, getting into why we conserve koalas in southeast Queensland, good question I hear you say. Um, so southeast Queensland of course is a very large koala population, it's home to in excess of 20% of Queensland's koalas, has a large amount of suitable habitat, it's got a suitable climate and of course uh, above all of these things we've definitely got a moral responsibility to conserve them. But there's a large number of challenges in southeast Queensland, in particular the development pressure, the development uh, associated threats that come with those developments, uh, urbanisation and of course um, the ongoing threat, increasing threat of climate change. So where have we got to so far with our threat um, mapping? We've been able to undertake a literature review and uh, we've got an internal report where we've investigated these threats. We looked at the criteria and the different approaches. We've been able to review the existing threat criteria which we've used previously in the koala habitat mapping to identify the koala priority areas and the koala habitat restoration areas. We've looked at some additional criteria that we might be able to incorporate into this mapping and we've investigating or starting to investigate the options for combining the threats into a combined risk layer and identify the koala threat priority areas. So um, this slide gives you our framework for threats, constraints, opportunities and resilience. So we've got a number of criteria here um, along the top line and then we've got a number of indicators uh, on the second row here and these various numbers of measures that we're using to, to, um, to track the threats. So in our framework we've, ident we've identified threats as being those things that directly impact the koalas and can cause harm to them. Constraints are those things that limit an area's ability to supply habitat or um, um, uh, constrain um, koala populations themselves. Um, on the other side of the ledger though are opportunities and resilience. So opportunities benefit koalas and we can leverage off that to um, uh, increase koala habitat or viability and then resilience are those things that enable koala populations to, to bounce back or provide sanctuary in, um, in times of crisis or climate crisis or fire, that type of thing. Um, so if we just look at some of the threats um, and constraints at the moment, so, um, so these are the negative things that are impacting on koalas. Here's an example of one of the uh, data layers. This is heat stress and it's made up of actually four data sets that represent the number of hot days, the number of consecutive hot days, hot nights and consecutive hot nights. We've combined these together to, to come up with a measure that represents heat stress. And we know that um, koalas suffer greatly if uh, temperatures are too hot, particularly during the night, which is when koalas uh, tend to feed. And if this heat goes on for several days, several nights. This can lead to starvation, um, loss of body condition and ultimately death of the koalas. So the, um, the measures um, enable us to look at uh, the data that represents hot nights um, going back, uh, back to 1950 to get a baseline. Data came from silo and when we did a statistical analysis it said it's a large proportion of the study areas already experiencing uh, statistically significant um, increases in temperature, which is not good. So another variable um, that we've used is uh, dog. This is dom uh, domestic dog density uh, based on the number of um, dog registrations with the local governments um, throughout southeast Queensland. So again, the, um, the red areas are uh, threat hotspots for in terms of um, dog, uh, dog density. Uh, another constraint here is um, the urban constraints, urban development. It's made up of two, two criteria. So the dwelling densities and the urban zoning. So this is the SEQ regional plan zonings, uh, gives us a combined threat of urban development. 
So this gives you some idea of what uh, what it might look like when we start to look at combining these layers. So this is the heat stress element um, that we showed you uh, just a second ago. And you can see these western areas where heat stress is uh, are dominating. Um, urban development, the, um, the threat is concentrated um, around Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, um, urban development areas. Then uh, when we look at the conservation layer, so, which is an opportunity that we have, uh, follows along the, the Dagula Range, for example. Um, but unfortunately, when we look at climate change, um, when we're seeing a contraction in the amount of habitat and it's actually affecting places like the Dagulas and of course, main range. So that limit, you can see how this is going to start to limit um, um, our ability to conserve koalas in a number of areas. Uh, so this map um, represents extractive industries so, and uh, our protected area estate. In these examples, um, the red is used to de designate areas which have got the high threats and blues areas where we've got low threats. So what we wanted to do is have a look at the interactions between the threats. So we came up um, with this causal diagram, which is a different way of looking threats uh, be, um, because we're actually looking at cause and effect. And it makes, uh, it's, a, it's a way we're using to actually make sense of the relationship between um, different elements. So here we have the end point, which is basically the koalas and their populations and the, and the resilience of those populations. And that's greatly influenced, of course, by the amount of habitat. So that's our end point. And the effects. Things that affect those greatly are things like habitat loss, habitat degradation, fragmentation those elements and um, death or injury of koalas impacts the koalas themselves. So what we're starting to see here is a web of interactions and the modes in which they apply. So for example, changes to habitat uh, influence, um, they could uh, directly cause the death or injury of koalas or things like fire uh, could do that. Fire could also degrade the habitat and influence um, the habitat itself and, and lead to declines in the koalas. So the um, usual suspects, you know, the cars, dogs and disease. So we've built those into, into our model. And so disease, for example, can be, result in reduced um, fertility and fecundity, which means koalas are having fewer offspring and that directly impacts the size and um, persistence of these koala populations. So the main impact cause, of course, comes from land management aspects. So urban development, linear infrastructure, resource extraction, intensive agriculture, and other land uses, and of course, climate change. So climate change can increase the amount of fire, increase the amount of uh, uh, the number of droughts and severity of droughts, or cause heat stress, and then that directly uh, causes death to koalas and population declines. So that's our that's our causal diagram. Um, and it enabled us to look at the impact mode and and then um, hopefully um, gives us the ability to intervene or mitigate some of these threats um, and uh, do something about it ultimately. So uh, this um, it helps us to monitor whether our in interventions ultimately are working. So the next steps in our in our threat project is to look at incorporating um, additional threats. So uh, we'd like to get data on wild dog um, densities across southeast Queensland, um, areas of disease hotspots, uh, fragmentation of habitat. Um, and some of the drought impacts if we could do, if we could get that data from uh, the long paddock or silo. Um, we've uh, we're also looking at the koala occurrence data and habitat fragmentation and mapping. So we can do that, things like frag stats. And we want to develop a combined threat layer and um, move on to developing links with other programs. 
So just have a quick look at um, some of our next steps, which is this is some of the occurrence data. So in this diagram here, you can see the blue dots representing koala occurrence. Um, so koala reports. The green, the dark green is our core remnant habitat that uh, Stephen spoke about in an in earlier presentation. And the bits that are not mapped are smaller, so fragmented habitat. So it's non-remnant non habitat. Or it's not high value regrowth habitat as mapped by the Queensland Herbarium. And what this is showing us is if, um, if the clearing of these patches occurs, what well, we can end up with severe uh, bottlenecks, um, limited ability for koalas to disperse and move across these landscapes. And these populations of koalas could become uh, uh, locally extinct. And as we know, we've got a very large number of koala records that are, occur in the um, non-remnant habitat. And we're keen to identify these pinch points where the habitat is really vital to, to maintain in the in the landscape um, so that we don't um, further fragment and, and lose these populations. So we could use um, some type of fragmentation analysis to, to do this. Also looking at the links between the koala occurrence and uh, the habitat. So on the right, we've got the map of the habitat, um, which is ranked from lower suitabilities in the green to the highest suitability in the red. So you can see areas like the Koala Coast with large amounts of highly suitable habitat. So this is the remnant and high value regrowth that's left. Uh, then on this map, um, we're showing the koala occurrence uh, hotspots. So areas like the Koala Coast or Pine Rivers, out through Ipswich Esk, uh, the Lockyer, up, up to Noosa, Mullaney, to Gulawa down to the Gold Coast, uh, Cooma, Eleanor, those types of areas. And so uh, these are based on the density of koala sightings. And what it means is that the koala, koala occurrence doesn't always uh, coincide with, um, with uh, where we've mapped um, suitable habitat. So that's that linkage that we were saying before uh, between the koala habitat and the koalas themselves. What we want to move on to next is to develop a methodology so that we can actually create this combined threat layer. We're looking at using um, weighted overlays, uh, which are very important to work out how to um, choose our weights and the importance. And this is often done using expert opinion. To reduce the bias or um, any differences in that um, or subjectivity in that, we can use things like um, an analytical hierarchy or the Delphi method. And the other thing we'd like to do is consider the threat interactions by developing something like a threat web, um, which can also use um, expert opinion and um, discuss these interactions. So th this is an example of a threat interactions. This is um, a bivariate example. So where you have urban development, for example, influencing, um, impacting habitat, to causes it to, to be lost, and then influencing koalas, or urban development um, directly impacting on koalas by um, increasing the number of uh, car strikes. Um, so there's different types of threat interaction. So this is a threat web, and you can start to see that these can start to get uh, quite complicated. So this is what we're, what we're looking at at the moment. So the other thing we're doing is um, a risk analysis. Um, so the elements here that are in black are the ones that they're our group, the biodiversity assessment team um, looking at undertaking. So developing this risk matrix. Um, the ones in blue are the programs within department um, like undertaking. So implementing the threat abatement or mitigation strategies themselves. So what we're hoping to do is identify the likelihood and consequence of the different threats and how these might be interacting and do that as part of a structured decision making process. So our, uh, I think the final element is really looking at the links to other par partner organisations. So um, we, we feel that the uh, threat mapping could help inform other abatement programs by local government, uh, contributed contribute to fauna sensitive design guidelines, um, uh, identify locations for community 
restoration and revegetation programs, assist with public education campaigns for koala conservation, and help coordinate research and fill uh, knowledge gaps that might be apparent. Some of the things that we like to keep in the back of our mind are these threat questions based on uh, the fact that we know the main threats to koalas, uh, but um, we, we have less understanding of the interactions and tipping points. Um, the illustration here on the right um, is based on some of the work done by uh, Jonathan Rhodes and uh, Clive McAlpin's groups. And it shows that at a certain certain um, amount of habitat in the environment, we often see this tipping point, um, a threshold is reached where koala habitat, um, koala numbers um, crash um, when a certain threshold is reached. Knowing knowing what that threshold is, is um, one of the key elements of uh, landscape ecology. Um, and this relationship isn't always linear, so. Um, yeah, what we need to um, always bear in mind is how much habitat can we keep in the landscape to ensure the long-term viability of uh, koalas and high numbers of koalas in the environment. Um, we're also interested in this idea of empty habitat. You know, what's causing this? Is it that the habitat's not suitable or is it just that it's not accessible? Koala populations have um, died out or been um, killed off by other components. Um, Disease as an ongoing issue with koala populations. What causes this disease expression? Does fragmentation affect it, for example? We've got a fantastic example from the Moreton Bay Railing Study. Um, it was published by uh, Hawthorne Bayer um, and showed um, um, that uh, dog control and vaccinations um, led to a uh, increasing viability of that population. So um, uh, that's thanks to the work of John Hanger and his group um, able to look at um, turning that population around. And um, that's about um, that's about me, I think. So that's moving on if anybody's got any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Harriet. You, you certainly generated a number of questions and um, unfortunately we haven't got a lot of time for those, but Quickly, there was a question there about considering that grazing, agriculture, road strikes, climate change and invasive species also occur outside our SEQ. Um, the question is, how is the SEQ focus justified? And are we focusing on an area that is preferable for humans to live and work instead of areas uh, that contain koalas? So um, it's not a technical question, but I guess it's a question of the, the approach that the government's taking. So. If, if you're happy to tackle that or I can provide a response. Uh, I think I can do a little bit, which of course is the, it goes to that slide where we know that a very large proportion of the koala population is actually in southeast Queensland. So as uh, Tim uh, said before, Queensland's very large, koalas are distributed um, a lot, across a large proportion of Queensland, but the most, the biggest concentration of koalas um, of wild koalas in Australia is in, in is in southeast Queensland, so um, it's by no means um, would 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 we say that there are no threats outside of southeast Queensland or no koalas outside of southeast Queensland. Um, but our, yes, our current focus is um, is in this um, is in this southeast Queensland area. But you might like to follow up on that, Jeff. Yeah, happy, happy to add a little bit extra. I guess both the expert panel report and the government's response to the expert panel report indicated that the types of mapping that's being developed and applied in SEQ can certainly uh, has scope for expansion into other areas of Queensland. Obviously, the focus is very much on managing threats to the high density population that exists in southeast Queensland, but that's to say at no means to at the expense of koalas elsewhere in Queensland. Um, the time frame for that obviously will be dependent on um, how successful we are in, in implementing these things in southeast Queensland. Um, so that it's not to say that that focus ignores what's happening elsewhere in the state. Certainly some of these threats and the information from the habitat mapping is also used in essential habitat mapping, which again is used to identify and protect koala habitat outside of SEQ. 
got one more question I think that we can uh, have time for and that's um, have wild and feral dogs been included as, as a threat layer or a consideration uh, particularly given the instance of the wild dog impact on koalas that was identified in the Morton Rail project? Uh, yes, so wild dogs um, is one of the data sets we'd like to incorporate in this next phase. Um, we weren't able to um, easily get get a data, well, it's difficult to get a data set that actually represents wild dogs. So we're definitely looking at incorporating that into this um, um, into this threat threat mapping because um, absolutely right. I mean, the, the wild dogs just devastated the um, koala population in around the, the um, Morton Bay Rail Link for sure. Yeah, we've got to do, we've got to include that in, in the analysis. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome back to the fourth presentation of today's uh, Koala CoLab 2021 conference series. Um, our fourth presenter today is Professor Armando Apan. Um, Armando is the Professor of Geographic and Information Systems and Remote Sensing at the University of Southern Queensland. His research interests focus on the applications of remote sensing and GIS to observe terrestrial ecosystems and their responses to environmental climate change. He's applying geospatial technologies to map, monitor and model forest vegetation, biodiversity, land cover and use, agricultural crops, floods and droughts. He has over 180 published papers in international refereed journals and conference proceedings. He was also the recipient of the Queensland Spatial Science Excellence Award uh, for Education and Professional Development in 2006 and was elevated as a Fellow of Australia's Surveying and Spatial Sciences Institute in that same year. So um, today, Amanda will be presenting in relation to GIS and remote sensing um, in southwest Queensland. Thanks very much, Amanda. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my presentation is about uh, modeling and mapping of wild habitat and threats in the southern inland Queensland. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-investigator, uh, Utam Sresta and uh, Kate Reardon-Smith. And uh, basically, we are involved in this project together, although the modeling majority of those uh, was uh, made by uh, Dr. Sresta. Basically, something different or uh, some aspects that's not uh, mainstream in our study is number one, we are focused, we will be focused on southern inland Queensland. And uh, that's uh, a, an area we're concerned, uh, part of our region as well. And another aspect that some, that's uh, more or less different is we would like to focus or we would focus on the impacts of climate change. Um, there has been a study on this, but uh, the resolution that that they did is relatively coarse. And the final aspect that we we considered uh, something new or innovative is uh, we used uh, BioMod2, which is an ensemble uh, um, of um, modeling algorithms uh, in R, in addition to the Max and uh, uh, a software algorithm that's being used. So the presentation outline covers the following. I'll be presenting a brief uh, uh, information about the rationale of the project, the objectives, and the study area. Uh, my uh, slides cover two major parts. The first one is habitat suitability mapping, and the second one is on threats analysis and mapping. And then I'll end up with conclusion and a uh, few acknowledgement. So the rationale of the project, uh, we know that the maps of quality distribution and the habitat suitability are one thing, especially in the southern inland Queensland and uh, limited information exists about uh, threats to koala populations and this distribution. For uh, climate change impact analysis, the existing uh, course scale, which is about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, we covered the whole of Australia, uh, has uh, limited use. So the, that uh, gives us the, the, the objectives for uh, this course, uh, for this um, uh, pr presentation. The first one is to generate the koala habitat suitability maps using SDM. In the previous presentation, they already talked about that. 
but we focus on uh, climate change or cl current and future climate. The second one is to identify, prioritize, and map spatial explicit threats to koalas, and uh, also to analyze the cumulative impacts of these threats in relation to the distribution of koalas. And the last one is uh, to engage with the stakeholders to uh, better inform strategic planning and uh, management. So our study area. So basically, it's, it covers the catch, a catchment boundary, the QM, uh, QMDB, Queensland Murray Darling Basin, uh, if you can see uh, in this uh, area, yeah, we have here Toowoomba and then major towns or city includes uh, Chinchilla, Roma here, and then Charleville, Kanamala, St. George. And it covers approximately 259 square kilometers. Vegetation types include eucalypt and brigalo woodlands on the east, grassland with scattered acacia on the northwest, and uh, malga acacias in the southwest. And there are uh, many river floodplains and uh, drainage channels uh, that support many ko koala feed trees. So I would like to present an overview of the methods that, that we have used uh, for the habitat suitability modeling. So first we, uh, we collected data and pre-processed, uh, including uh, assembling and filtering of koala occurrence data, a typical procedure in many SDM studies. And then we collected climate, bioclimatic variables as well as environmental variables. And then we have done correlation analysis. The purpose of those is to uh, uh, exclude or include variables. In addition to this, we also uh, did the uh, methods to reduce uh, sampling bias and other um, uh, pre-processing techniques to ensure that you know, we will get a, a, a valid result. So after that, we have done uh, modeling and validation. Uh, we use uh, species distribution modeling, uh, but we uh, did some schemes where we collect, uh, we analyze first climate only variables. Second uh, part, we uh, we analyze environmentally environment only variable, and then we can combine that. And we did the analysis for the current uh, uh, climate, 2030, and then 2070. And then output generation, we have maps of probability distribution to uh, generate some information about area and you know percentages. We categorize that probability distribution into different categories uh, like suitability classes as low, medium, high, very high. And then we have summary statistics. Okay, so data sets used, we have used lots of data, but uh, we ended up you know, uh, in the final model we have this. So in the species distribution modeling part, we obviously we use uh, location data, occurrence data from, you know, uh, these different sources. Uh, we have bioclimatic variables, we use NARCLIM data. So our study attempted to really, like, we would like to have a high resolution, relatively high spatial resolution with regards to climate modeling. Because if you will Probably, probably you're aware that the, the best resolution we could get outside dark claim data is uh, the 1,000 meter or one kilometer. And uh, that has a severe limitation with regards to resolution. So dark claim climate data was developed by New South Wales and ACT uh, climate modeling project. And uh, it so happened that uh, this part of Queensland was covered by that uh, data set. And then uh, we have also use different environmental variables from different sources, including uh, elevation, altitude, soil, land use, vegetation types, uh, etc., from different data sources. For mapping threats, we have initially considered 12 mappable threats uh, during the workshop we have conducted. I will discuss more of that. Uh, but we ended up uh, incorporating uh, these uh, six uh, variables or threats because uh, you know uh, we have to be able to map or make at least surrogate maps uh, out of those identified threats. So with regards to koala occurrence points, um, we, as I mentioned, we obtained uh, those data, uh, those uh, points uh, close to thousand. But because we have to remove duplicates, you know, and uh, uh, points with dubious locations, and also we have to ensure that there's only one point inside this 250 meter by 250 meter cell size, we have to uh, use 
523 unique occurrence points. And that's a typical requirement for the modeling. So for the bioclimatic data, as I mentioned, uh, we use the data from NARCLIM project. It's uh, relatively high resolution, 250 meter data. Uh, we use the this uh, CSRO MK30 uh, GCM and R2 configuration. Uh, for the climate, the, uh, climate, current climate, we have uh, this uh, data set for this uh, period here. And for uh, the projected uh, climate, we have this 2030 and 2070. So initially we have 35 variables, but we have to reduce it to 10 bioclimatic variables. These are those variables here from annual mean temperature to you know, uh, mo uh, lots of these, including moisture index, seasonality, etc. And the reason why I have to, we have to do that is uh, in uh, SDM modeling, we have to uh, remove those uh, variables with high multicollinearity to make the model modeling dependable. So this is just a, a more detailed uh, representation of the modeling tools. I already mentioned about data preparation analysis. But more specifically for the modeling and validation, so we use uh, ensemble models, different model uh, available in BioMod2 package in R, where you know we use 70% data sets for training and 30% uh, for testing, which is pretty much standard in, in many modeling uh, uh, methodology. Uh, we use um, different measures of uh, accuracy for model validation. And uh, we selected those models at least with uh, greater than 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.6 uh, TSS uh, 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 score. And then we use uh, uh, the different uh, models. We, we did an ensemble using weighted mean. And then uh, for the output, we have the distribution and then, of course, the suitability classes with the very high, high, moderate, and low. And now, for the environment-only variables, uh, you know, because we are familiar with with max and just like in any uh, like modeling, so for the environment-only variables, so we use max and probably we can also use biomod, but uh, because you know uh, uh, it's something that's uh, available and easily to manipulate. Many of, many of our programs are in uh, max and as well, so we use this. So basically, same thing we use. Uh, different uh, environmental variables, as I mentioned here. Okay, so altitude, soil, land use, vegetation, site as the final environmental variables use. And I believe uh, many of you are familiar with SDM. Uh, if not, uh, basically SDM is uh, also called niche modeling, bioclimatic envelopes, habitat suitability modeling. And it assumes that the current distribution of the species is good indicator of ecological requirements. Uh, it estimates the probability of a species occurring in a place as a function of the environmental conditions of that place. And uh, this is a, a mature modeling technique. Uh, in fact, if you Google search uh, SDM, there, there's actually 2.79 million results in uh, Google Scholar about SDM. Okay, so for our um, algorithm, for modeling, as I mentioned, we used BioMod2 in R. So we basically used eight algorithms out of 17. So the first four models are regression based and the last four are machine learning. And we had uh, we conducted a, a workshop attended by over 35 people from different government agencies, organizations, local community groups, private individuals, uh, and also academics. So basically we have uh, First workshop discussion with the local community groups about data and information needs, and also uh, workshop number two presented uh, our preliminary results. We discuss about uh, habitat threats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So results. Uh, this is a, a map of the suitable habitat for koala under current climate. So basically, uh, we have this. Uh, output, which is what we call in GIS um, terminology, it's a continuous variable, continuous surface. Uh, and uh, the, this value is from 0 0.07 to, you know, uh, to 1, basically. So that's the output. And you will note here that, you know, uh, here near the dividing range, great dividing range, this is the close to Toowoomba and, you know, Darling Downs area. And as you move west, you know, uh, of the catchment, you will see that here that the suitability 
is low. Okay, and uh, we we sort of expected that, and that's uh, really the the modeling. And uh, the the modeling uh, produced good outputs, uh, higher than zero point six zero, where one is uh, the best and uh, neg negative one is the worst. So now we converted this probability distribution into suitability classes. Now this is a methodology or a part of the analysis where we just want to you know, convert this into uh, classes for the purpose of basically we would like to categorize you know as uh, low mid, uh, low moderate high very high uh, and the good thing about this is we can generate some statistics like area for each class and percentages of each class but the true value of any modeling really is the one here on the left Okay, because I can apply many different schemes on how to categorize. You know, I can, in, in a GIS environment, you can apply at least four or five methods from manual method to interval to, you know, Jenks optimization and many things. But in this case, we use a geometric, uh, inter, geometrical interval, which is the one suitable for our uh, data set. Now, for 2030, uh, you can see here that uh, there has been a, de a slight decrease with regards to the uh, map. And if you will compare, for example, with this one in, in current climate, you can see that, you know, this area here or near Tobumba, that in the, the great dividing rates, it's now reduced. Okay, I show you some statistics. Okay, and after that, 2070, uh, that's the, the output. And uh, I'll be able to quantify the different areas and the percentages of the suitability classes uh, in a minute. So if we will uh, combine everything here from current to 2030 to 2070, uh, these are the different uh, uh, like uh, areas, total area in square kilometers of uh, current 2030 and 2070. And we can see here that uh, for current uh, suitability, uh, like 25% is called very high, this category. Uh, in 2030, there is a reduction Okay, from 21% to 17% of the total area. And interestingly, in 2070, it increased a bit also, uh, like to 20%. So with high similar trend, but something that's probably I would like to highlight here is the moderate uh, class. There is a consistent decline from 28% to 27% to 26%. And correspondingly, the low suitability is increasing with a bit of you know, change here. So we can quantify this and we can sort of understand not just the statistic, the data in area and percentages, but also the location of those uh, pixels or uh, grids. Now, and for the environmental variables, um, this is the original variables that we included, like altitude, slope, uh, soil, vegetation, distance to water. And this is uh, a separate from climate only. So this is for the environment only. And uh, we use different data set um, you know, from different sources. And uh, what we want to do is to really be able to uh, look at the most important environmental variables. And ultimately we used uh, these four, soil, altitude, land use, vegetation. And uh, we base it on the area under the uh, receiver operator carb of 0 0.85. So this is the one, uh, these are the variables we use for environment, the environment only input for modeling. Okay, so this is the, the output of uh, that modeling. And uh, this is the probability um, distribution map. It's more crisp because we were able to use uh, uh, 30 meter cell size compared to climate only the best we could get for climate only modeling is uh, the 250 meter. So the AUC value is uh, uh, 0.88, which is an indicator of good model performance. So with regards to result, this is a, a combination now. So we have the climate only here on top. We have the probability, uh, the environment only here at the bottom. And we have the ability to, to combine this as an option to see, you know, uh, if we have uh, those uh, two uh, schemes of modeling. So this is the climate and environmental environment variable combined. Now, so again, from the final uh, suitability, uh, suitability habitat map, 
uh, we have uh, categorized that into four. Okay, so climate plus the environment variables. Now, with regards to uh, comparison, we would like to compare what happened with the performance of the climate only and the environment only. We can say, for example, for very high uh, suitability class, 19%, uh, but for the environmental environment only model, it's 11%. And the reason is, of course, uh, with the environment only model, it's more restrictive because, uh, you know, we have more uh, like factors that govern the, the distribution, including land use, vegetation types, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we can combine that, we can have this different statistic. So threats analysis. Um, similarly, we have uh, followed the different procedure here. So first, threat identification and ranking from uh, literature and workshop, I just mentioned. So, and then we collected the data. The main challenge in uh, any sort of mapping is if you have a variable, uh, you have to find the right expression of that variable in mappable form or something that you can map. Because if you cannot map it, you cannot include in this sort of modeling. And uh, yeah, uh, we have done that and uh, we, uh, we uh, process the data. Um, now, the question then is, how would you combine all those threats to come up with a single map? And there are many ways to do it, but for our purpose, we uh, use the weighted uh, overlay approach, weighted linear combination. I mean, we can use many uh, methods, but for the purpose of our work, we use this. And uh, yes, so uh, after that, we uh, combine the threats and the existing and, and the habitat suitability map with uh, the one we obtained from the previous habitat modeling. I'm sorry. And uh, when you combine those, you will be able to identify the different combinations okay, between threats and suitability. And uh, to come up with some strategies, we did not uh, develop um, actual strategies, but that could be done, you know, with regards to, say, prioritization, which uh, the previous speakers have mentioned. Okay, so with regards to threats, so as I mentioned, we have 12 variables, and uh, finally, we have uh, six. Okay, so this was uh, done during the workshop. So different experts, they have to individually identify and rank the different threats, and we have a procedure where we could identify the different uh, like the most important, so to, so to speak, of uh, those variables. And we have habitat conversion, loss of uh, habitat, presence of uh, dingoes or wild, uh, wild dogs. Uh, we, collect, we, 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 we have done that using another SDM modeling. We have uh, also have traffic uh, collision, uh, collision as uh, you know important uh, variable here, but we would, uh, use uh, road density as a proxy. We have uh, fire. Okay, and then urbanization, we have the population grid, habitat loss, and then, you know, uh, part of that data is from uh, tree cover change from Global Forest Watch. So these are the maps. And uh, based on our ranking, we used uh, uh, the workshop, the expert ranking, we have this following weights for forest loss, 25%, for habitat conversion, 20%, for fire, 20%, population, 15 bingo, 10 road, 10%. So we use these different uh, weights for a GIS-based weight based weighted analysis. And uh, also uh, we have these uh, uh, results that we obtained where we were able to uh, put some values, uh, 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 you know, it's scale from one to nine, where one is lowest and uh, nine is highest. So this is the number of pixel with the trans uh, log transformed. So basically, we were able to uh, output this using the GIS best method. Now, this is a, quite a busy map, but the idea here really is we want to know the different threats in the different suitability classes. Because, you know, we would like to know, for example, what's the threat situation in very high suitability areas or in moderate suitability areas? So here, we were able to look at, for example, area with at least one threat. And then the one in percent, the percent of total area. And then another uh, column in the table is uh, the area with threat, with threat intensity score greater than five. Okay. And of course, the percentage. So basically, we can see here that, you know, in very high and high suitable area, 
the threats are also high. Okay, fourteen uh, percent, at least one one uh, one threat, which is probably low. But also, you can say relatively, there are also uh, big threats uh, for uh, relatively for those greater than five uh, threat intensity score. So that's the situation, and we can identify that on a map. Uh, when we combine those. So I think the, if we will combine the, com the threats and also the suitability class, uh, similar with other presenters, they would come up with something like, you know, combination like high threat and high suitability, moderate threat and moderate suitability, and then low threat and low suitability. And this is something that's, uh, you know, that could be useful for many conservation uh, uh, work in terms of prioritization, resource allocation, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, this is a relatively high uh, area. Now, the extent is relatively high. If you look here at the scale, you know, that's 100 kilometers. And you can say, you know, with a map, with this kind of map with 250 meter cell size, you know, looking at, uh, you know, uh, let's say local level planning, probably you can say, is this, is it really useful? So we look at example like this, so like a Pittsworth locality, which is, uh, uh, near uh, Toowoomba. So for example, we were able to look at mapping those uh, combination of threats and habitats. So we have uh, this uh, green here as low, a uh, combination of threats and habitats and high. So that's the sort of uh, use, possible use of the data sets that we have produced, generated from this uh, project. So in conclusion, uh, koala habitat suitability, that is uh, including current and projected uh, climate uh, and threats were successfully mapped with good model performance. And uh, from here, uh, climate change will have a significant impact on the area of habitat uh, potentials uh, of habitat potentially suitable for koalas in the study area. And 83%, so this big, uh, of the total area has at least one threat intensity level to koala populations and uh, the distribution of threats, uh, areas of more suitable habitat are also having a higher threat level. Okay, so I just want to end this um, uh, presentation. It's a bit fast <laughs> by uh, uh, thanking uh, Queensland Department of Environment and Science for funding this and also for the many people who participated in the two workshops we held uh, here at USQ and also online. And uh, we have produced a report of these and data sets. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share the, the, the report and data sets for those who are interested. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amanda. Uh, again, I think your presentation again demonstrates that there's, there's interest in looking at koala distribution and threats beyond Southeast Queensland and the work that you and your team have done is certainly um, taking us into a new area of exploring. Uh, how we might model and map koala habitat in those broader areas in, in Western and Central Queensland. Um, there's, a, there's a number of questions um, that have come up, uh, some that are technical related to your presentation, some that are, are broader, which I'll probably seek to address either in written answers or otherwise. One key question here was, um, um, the, the questioner was just interested in how you might account for standing water and drainage lines, uh, particularly given the observation that these are really important to koalas in the western parts of their range. So, yes, uh, that's uh, a good question. Yes, uh, actually, we included that in the initial modeling uh, in the environment only variables. We have a, a data set called distance uh, from uh, drainage and water uh, sources. So, we included that. Uh, but in the final model, because of, you know, we have to select the most important variables uh, to get the best uh, modeling output. So we did not include that in the final model. But in the initial uh, screening of, the, of the, the variables, we included that distance from water or water sources. Okay, thanks for that. Um, there's a couple of questions with regards to um, using uh, different inputs into the mapping. Um, you, I think you covered off on, on the use of including predators and the life cycles of koalas um, 
as part of that modeling i'm not sure if you wanted to add anything further to to that um yeah, yeah we attempted the, to uh, you know look at predators there has been a number of discussion during the workshop and the problem really is data set uh we could not really find the best uh, variable with regards to predator and other and related the issue uh so we ended up with the uh, dingo uh, data set because we have that we have a colleague who is uh, working uh, with dingo uh, ben allen and uh, we did uh, the kind of modeling but yeah that's a challenge and uh, hopefully in the future we'll be able to develop some more uh, like a better technique to incorporate the predator uh, variable okay um there's another question here which is um it's it's about the whether the the modeling and mapping you're using is dynamic so i guess the question is if the scope or um scale of threats changed um is the is the modeling and the mapping approach you've adopted dynamic such that uh those outputs from that mapping would change okay yes um well with regards to the use of uh, biomode and max and uh, you know there there are facilities or options to incorporate um like new data sets that will that will say portray uh, changes like for example we use 2030 climate and 2070 climate so it means that if there will be changes in land use land cover we have to do the modeling again in other words another run of the model so that's the only way but uh, when you say you know it's like is it like when we do some sort of a sensitivity analysis by just changing or sliding some values or thresholding it's not possible at this stage but you know it means we have to run again and probably not a difficult thing because uh, you know, like in Biomod, it's we have the code to do that. It's a matter of pre-processing the new data set, like uh, new new sets of land cover, like land cover, updated land cover land use. And that's the only way to do it, uh, unfortunately. But we can run it again. Okay, there's a couple of questions here, which I'm uh, trying to respond to, which actually relate more to the broader protection mechanisms around koalas. So um, we'll, again, as we've done in previous sessions, we'll seek to provide some written response to, to people in relation to those questions. Um, just trying to access that final question. Um, the, the, you're obviously, the, the question that one, one particular person has asked a question about uh, what variables you're using both biotic and abiotic um, variables and in terms of climate are you using only temperature or are you using rainfall humidity and other climate related factors okay yes so uh, with the narclim uh, bioclimatic variables so it's a combination of uh, of uh, temperature and uh, precipitation but there are also a combination of those to come up with the uh, bioclimatic uh, expression uh, i don't know if uh, yeah i probably i don't have time to show uh, this but uh, we have uh, now let's see yeah yes because i cannot remember everything we have uh, many of those in fact there are 35 so we ended up with you know like annual mean temperature by one mean the urinal te temperature range etc so yeah, uh, it's uh, these bioclimatic variables that uh, that uh, presented as important in modeling. Uh, Ten of those, and we use that. But if the question is something about uh, you know, like what sort of scenario that yeah. we have used, uh, the scenario that we use is CSR or MK three point zero global uh, GCM. So it's a scenario where it's a, a warm, dry scenario relative to nineteen ninety to nineteen ninety to two thousand and nine. And uh, I believe it's R2, uh, R2 configuration. So uh, they say that it's uh, probably the best or the, the best among the three. So it's a uh, scenario where it's a warm, dry uh, climate in the future. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Amanda. again. Um really complimentary presentation to the other presentations that we've had this morning. So thanks very much for that input. Um, 
that presentation wraps up today's um, Koala CoLab uh, event. Uh, we'll be having the other events on the following Wednesdays over the next five weeks. Uh, certainly invite you to participate in those sessions. Um, the information uh, from uh, today's session will now um, also be available to, to review uh, via the portal. The next session, as I said, is on Wednesday, the 20th of October, commencing at 9.30 a.m., going through till 11.45. Um, certainly encourage you to um, invite colleagues and other people to attend. Uh, these sessions are free, so we're very keen to get as many people involved as we can. Uh, apologies to those people who haven't yet got answers to their questions. As I said, we do intend to provide those responses um, so that we can address the, the various questions and, and comments that have come up through the forum today. So thank you to all the presenters and thank you to everyone for attending.